Well, good morning, Grace Church. Why don't you stand to your feet as we worship? Our hope is not found out there. Our hope is found in our King of glory, the Lord who is strong and mighty in battle. Those who trust him will never be put to shame. Amen. Let's sing this together. Oh, don't lose heart, oh my soul, oh my soul. Don't give up, there is hope, there is always hope. One of my favorite lines in that song says, don't forget he is Lord of all. I don't know about you, but I feel like this day couldn't come soon enough this week. <laughs> you know, Just when all the saints would be gathered together. If you're with us online, you're gathered with us in spirit. I just want to welcome you, but also let's just take this service. Let's just take this time to slow our hearts down a little bit and just rest in the truth of Jesus. I think just, you know, with everything going on in the country, it just, man, everything, just every week, it just gets more crazy. I think it's easy to feel out of control, but just at least in this moment, when as we're gathered together as believers, let's just rest in the one who is in control of everything. Amen. Yeah. So this is my wife, Ashley, uh, for those that don't know, and um, our kids end up coming to rehearsal with us uh, during the week. And so they hear these songs like over and over and over. And um, we're about to sing this song where the last line in the chorus says, um, and even so come Lord Jesus come. And so my oldest Isabel, she uh, asked me a question. She said, dad, she has a really sensitive heart. She says, daddy, we're not like telling Jesus what to do, are we? (laughs) 
And I'm like, no, no one gets to tell Jesus what to do. Um, it's actually a reference to the last verse in Revelation um, where Jesus says, surely I am coming soon. And then the apostle John agrees and just says, amen, come Lord Jesus. So it's almost like, come on, like, let's go, let's do this. And so this morning as we sing, let's unite our hearts around that, that we're excited for the fact that Jesus is coming back. We rest in him as our hope and that we are going to be a bride ready for his return. In all of creation, all of the earth, make straight a highway, a path for the Lord. Jesus is coming soon. And call back the sinner, wake up the saint, let every nation shout of your fame. Jesus is coming soon. Yes, he is. Like a bride waiting for her groom, will be a church ready for you. Every hour longing for our King, we sing even so. So come, Lord Jesus, come. There will be justice. There will be justice. All be new. Your name forever, faithful and true. Yes, Jesus is coming soon. Psalm 33, starting in verse 20, says, Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield, for our heart is glad in Him, because we trust in His holy name. Let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us, even as we hope in you. How 
break the chasm that lay between us How high the mountain I could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven And spoke your name into the night Then through the darkness Your loving kindness Tore through the shadows of my soul The work is finished The end is written Jesus Christ, my living hope Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. And the cross has spoken. I am forgiven The King of Kings calls me His Oh, thank you, Jesus Beautiful Savior I'm yours forever Jesus Christ, my living hope And we sing Hallelujah Praise the one who saved me Christ. 
Amen. Amen. You may be seated this morning. Thanks for coming. You came back. I didn't know if after last week you, you would come back. So thanks for coming back. And I see you in the balcony. Thanks, man, for sitting up there. I do appreciate it. And we want you to feel like connected, right? We really do. Uh, and we, I don't know if you guys know this or not, but we have a, uh, a chapel behind us here. And so traditional style of worship, it's fantastic. A room full of people. So we want to welcome everyone in the chapel. We also have a, a Chaska campus, right, that meets at Southwest Christian High School. So we want to welcome all of those folks. And then we have like literally like thousands of people every weekend who, who watch online. So a huge hello. So let's give it a round of applause for all those watching online today. Like we love you and we hope you feel engaged. You know, I thought uh, it would be appropriate for us, right, to, uh, in light of all that's going on again, and someone asked me about this, like, are you going to do a message and all this going on in our country? I'm like, I could do a message every week on something that is going on in our country, right? It's one of the reasons I think that worship is so important. I don't know about you, but like, you could get, like, down and depressed and discouraged throughout the week. But what worship does, worship kind of lifts your eyes to eternity, doesn't it? And so when things feel really uncertain, you look at eternity and you get perspective for here and now. That's what worship does. That's why it is actually so important, like for our souls, right? It's actually good for us. So I want to make sure that you don't ever equate like just going to church with worship. Big difference between the two. Worship is when you in your heart, you celebrate the living and dying and the rising again of the person of Jesus Christ. Amen. Like we focus on him and he is in control. And I've said this before, so long as Jesus is on his throne and his people are on the ground, everything's going to be okay, right? And we know that's true. And we know that's true. But I thought it'd be good for us to pray together. Let's take a few moments. Let's pray because our prayers matter. Like our prayers make a difference. God hears our prayers and God does his work through our prayers. So let's pray for our country. Let's pray for peace, right? For unity. Let's pray down violence, of course. So let's do that as God's people today. God, we quiet our hearts because in the stillness we know that we know you most fully. And so today as the church, we pray for peace. In our country, we pray for unity. We pray for our government leaders. We pray for our fractured country. We do. Uh, we pray for sanity. Lord, we pray that, uh, that your church would not lose heart and we pray today that you would give us an amazing sense of peace in our own hearts, that you would give us boldness today, that you would give us a vision for who you are and all you're doing. And God, we, we pray that the church of Jesus Christ would stay focused on her mission to glorify God by making disciples of Jesus Christ here and here and far away. And so we trust you. We know you're in charge, Lord. And so we give this to you in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. well, we are in a, a 1 Peter chapter 3 today. I'm going to skip over 1 Peter chapter 2, 19 to 25, and I'm going to do that at Easter, okay? So we're going to look at 1 Peter chapter 3 today. And, and I don't think it's, it's coincidental that, uh, that, that Peter kind of arranges the topics in this passage like he does. So he talks about submission. We're going to talk about that today. Last weekend, he kind of introduced this whole idea of being subject to every human institution. So at the governmental level, like how do we pray? How do we function? How do we honor right government leaders? And yet how we also understand that we don't blindly submit to to, to statements or mandates, right, or laws that would violate, right, God's word. 
And then today he kind of takes it from like be submissive kind of at this governmental level to, to your home. And he literally begins to kind of break it down at, at kind of a granular level of like how does this, this submission thing actually flesh itself out in your house? And, and you can control what's going on in, in your home, right? You can kind of really get your fingerprints on what's happening at your house, right? And you can make decisions that actually bless your family, bless your spouse, and certainly bless the world. So the question is this, like what should a Christian wife do if, if her husband isn't a Christian and he's not at all interested in the person of Christ? Well, well 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 13 says that if, if the unbelieving husband is willing to stay married, that, that the wife shouldn't leave him. And so understand this principle that, that coming to Jesus Christ, if, a, if it's a husband or a wife, they've been unbelieving, one becomes a believer in Christ, that never becomes an excuse to cut and run. So you could never say, hey, I'm gonna divorce my husband if, if a wife trusts Christ. I wanna divorce my husband now because he's not a believer. The Bible would say, no, 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 your new vision, your new focus, your new task is now to introduce then your husband to the person of Jesus Christ. But you know, over, over the years I have watched uh, a lot of, I think really well-intentioned Christian wives try, I would say, some really desperate strategies. Uh, I'm not being nice here to win their pre-Christian husbands over to faith in Jesus Christ. So, so many, I think many inadvertently push their husbands away by like incessant invitations to come to church. So ladies, I would say like, Invite them, but don't invite them 24-7, 365, right? Be careful not to badger or harangue your husband like with, with constant invitations to church. It, it actually kind of wears him out and doesn't win him over. Uh, be careful of playing the comparison game with like the godly Christian family down the street. Like you know, like if you compare your unbelieving husband to a believing husband, you know that those comparisons just alienate and they, and they aggravate and they divide. Uh, be careful of putting your husband down with, uh, with derogatory remarks like, you know, such and so is spiritually discerned. But you wouldn't understand that now, would you? Be careful, like being condescending in your language. Another way to push him away is by like secretly downloading sermon podcasts onto his phone or, or by taping Bible verses to his beer cans. Probably not a good strategy. Or by leaving little Bible verses on his pillow at night before he goes to bed, right? Or by blowing the shofar to wake him up in the morning. No, no, a thousand times no. Or by continually reminding him, sweetheart, I'm praying that the Lord will awaken your dead, your dark, your disobedient, your depraved, your doomed heart today. Hashtag I love you. Like that's not winning him over, right? Uh, be careful about being at church all the time, right? And neglecting matters at home with the hope that he'll one day see the value of Christian service. Like all of the aforementioned examples, I think, do way more harm than they do good. So what is the best way for a Christian wife to win her husband over to Christ? The answer might surprise you. The answer is through submission and inner beauty. Now, before every female in this place like rises up on the inside and like to protest everything that I'm saying, right? Please don't lose it. Like, please don't head for the exits. Like, at least, at least hear me out on this, okay? Because Peter says that practicing submission towards your husband is actually a really effective way to point him to the person of Jesus Christ. So with that said, let's stand together. Let's dig into this teaching, what Peter says here. Peter says, likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be one without a word. That's really important. One without a word. You can win people. Or I'm not saying don't ever articulate the gospel. Obviously, we do that. But you can win them by your conduct, the conduct of their wives. When they see, check this out, your respectful and pure conduct. Do not let your adorning be external the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing that you wear. But let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart. I love that phrase, the hidden person of the heart. 
with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is, is very precious. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you are her children, if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. This is the word of the Lord. Ladies, hang with me. Hang with me. You may be seated. Because there, there is an admonition in verse 7 that we'll get to. So, so you, guys are, you guys love the Bible, right? You guys are Bible people, people of the book. And so we understand when he says likewise in verse 1, he's essentially saying in the same way. So he's, he's connecting all this teaching on submission that we launched into in chapter 2, verse 13, like we submit to human institutions, he's just like, he's pulling that forward into, into the home, right? So it's just a continuation of his teaching on this doctrine of submission, which by the way, right, everybody struggles with. Like nobody wants to be told what to do. And, and so I would say this, like today, the complementary roles of, of biblical headship for the husband and biblical submission for the wife are, I think, scoffed at, I think laughed at, uh, I think they are passed over as cultural leftover. So a lot of people will like read this passage and go, that teaching right there should never leave the first century, right? When, when in reality, right, we know that we, we got to study the context of the first century before we draw lines then to the 21st century to see how it applies, right? So a lot of people just like hear it and go, nope, 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 don't want to hear it, not relevant for today. But the truth of the matter is that leadership and submission are, are really beautiful and beneficial for marriage and family when they're done the right way. And so here's the thing, God cares about what happens in your house. And you should be glad that God cares about what happens like within the four walls of your home. Because unfortunately today in many homes, there's like no leadership, there's no direction by the husband or the wife, which leads to all kinds of frustration and division, right, and confusion. Or, right, some, some homes have two heads, right? I'm the boss, you're not the boss, I'm the boss. And so it is a clash of the titans, right? In, in leadership circles, right? It is a clash, right? Two heads, right? No one submitting to anyone. And then, then that leads to lots of competition, lots of fighting. It creates chaos and frustration and division in the home. And so here's what Peter says. He goes, look at this word first. The Greek word for submissive is hupotasso. And, and it's not a repressive term, it's a military term, right? We talked about that last weekend. It is a military term that means to arrange the troops in a strategic fashion under the command of a leader. So submit literally means to come under or beside someone to lift them up. And so here's what Peter says. Peter says, wives, when you, hupotasso, when you submit to your husband, it means that you're coming under him and beside him to give him support, to give him strength, Support in his leadership, support in decisions, right? Support in leading the home. And, and, and just to be clear, it doesn't mean that you're inferior in any way, shape, or form. It doesn't mean that you are inferior in terms of character or intelligence or spirituality. Uh, on the flip side, it doesn't mean that he's more intelligent. It doesn't mean that he's more capable. It doesn't mean that he's more gifted. The idea is that God wants your home to work. And God gives like role clarity, right? So husbands and wives will understand, here's my role, here's my role, so you can come together in unity and, and experience peace in your home. And so just to be clear, right, I think people like distort this word. Uh, submission doesn't mean that if you're a wife, it doesn't mean that like you're the doormat and he's the dirty boot. Submission doesn't mean that you agree with like everything your husband thinks or says. It doesn't mean leaving your brain or your will at the wedding altar. Like there is no correlation between submission and competence, right? Our passage actually presents a woman who hears the gospel of Jesus Christ and believes it and trusts in it. While her husband, obviously, verse 1, heard that same gospel message and said no to the gospel. So he heard the word and he rejected the gospel. And so notice that Peter does not tell the wife to retreat from her commitment, right? He says, no, no, you, you, you keep pursuing Jesus Christ. And so this is not like a call to like, 
just blind submission. So like if your husband like would say like, hey, honey, let's get drunk and knock off that bank. Like you, you know, you don't submit to that, right? Like you would know that if your husband is like going down a path of unbelief, you don't follow him now because you're called to be a disciple. If your husband is like trying to lead your children astray and take them down a path of unbelief, right? You, you know you don't follow him now. You're, you're a disciple. You're trying to disciple your kids. But ultimately, Peter says to Christian wives, the way to influence your husband the most is to have such a beautiful, cooperative disposition that even as you disagree, that it, that it, causes, your, it causes your husband to take pause. It causes your husband to say, man, like, I'm not into this Jesus thing, and she's really into this Jesus thing. And, and, and Jesus is actually, like, making her way more pleasant to be around. He's making a real difference in her life. Or the church is making her way more pleasant to live with. I probably need to check this out. So in that way, a submissive position and disposition is like one of the most evangelistic tools that a Christian wife has in her arsenal. So let me just ask this question, wives. Like, are you hitting the mark on this one, right? Like, are you, are you winning your husbands over with your Christianity? Or are they loving Jesus more, open to who Jesus is because of the way you're doing your Christianity, right? Notice the question here is like, are you, are you being respectful of, of your husband? Like, like being respectful of him, of his position? Like the number one thing we know that men need is what? They, they need respect, like love and respect. You've kind of heard of all that. And so as I thought about this, I thought about Sherry. And I thought, you know, if I weren't a follower of Jesus Christ, I would really be drawn to the person of Jesus Christ by the way she lives life. I would be drawn by her lifestyle. I'd be drawn by her work ethic. I would be drawn by the way uh, she is respectful. Uh, I would be drawn to her by the way she, she's quick to apologize if she ever needs to apologize. She says sorry, she's mature. Uh, I, w I would be drawn to her Christianity. And I, I see like the way she does it, man, it's like, you know what? It would like push me to investigate the claims of Jesus Christ based on who she is and how she follows Jesus Christ. And so wives, listen, is your Christianity building up your husband? Is it building up your home or is it tearing down both? And, and then Peter says the second way, the second way that Christian wives can win over their pre-Christian husbands to faith in Christ is through, he calls it like the, I would call it like the right kind of beauty. Look at verse three and four. It says, do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair, putting on gold jewelry, the clothing that you wear, but let the adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is precious in God's sight. So I just want to be clear here, like Peter isn't saying like, the exterior doesn't matter, right? So, so Mar Marley, like my middle daughter, came over a couple days ago, and Sherry had, uh, had walked the dog and hadn't taken a shower yet, and had her hair all pulled back, didn't have any makeup on, and, and Marley's like, uh, yo, mom, may want to paint the barn. Like, so like, like, if the, like if you need to paint the barn, paint it. Like, I'm not saying that, right? I'm not saying that. Like, a little makeup isn't bad, right? I think what, so he's not, he's not forbidding you from looking good, right? He's not forbidding you from like, like taking care of, of yourself, right? The exterior matters. And, and, and the truth is like the older you get, like gravity's real. Like I mean, like gravity's real. I was looking like in the mirror the other day and I'm like, I think like my chin, I got it like gravity's real. So I'm doing exercises all the time. You know, you gotta take care of, I'm gonna take care of the, the external me. So there are two yous that make up you. There's the external you that we can see. There's also the hidden person of the heart that we can't see, and that's the person that Peter's talking about. Like, you should care about the hidden person of the heart, too. So I think Peter's just kind of cautioning against a, a preoccupation with the exterior. Because we know in Roman society, right, there was like this immense focus on outward adornment. Like, women spent hours upon hours, like, like braiding their hair, uh, uh, dyeing their hair different colors. They were fond of expensive jewelry, elegant clothing, cosmetics. And like, he's not against that. He's just saying like, don't let that become the essence of who you are. Like, don't forget to adorn the hidden person of the heart too 
With, with what? With the imperishable beauty. With the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is actually very precious in God's sight. So let me just stop here for a moment and say this. Notice that, that external beauty. What does the Bible say about external beauty? That it is a perishable item. Did you notice that? You know what the word perishable means? So you buy bananas, and if you don't eat those bananas, what happens to those bananas? They turn brown and mushy and squishy, right? Why? They're perishable items. He says the same thing about external beauty. It's a perishable item. But he says the inner beauty is an imperishable, lasting beauty, right? Uh, Second, I would say this. If something is precious to God, and notice that he says this is precious in God's sight. If it's precious to God, it ought to be of the utmost importance to us. Like, if God's like, that's precious to me. We care so deeply about who God is and what he says. That ought to be valuable to us. So a a woman with her inner beauty, here's what the Bible says, actually becomes more and more and more beautiful and appealing as the years roll on. And husbands, how many of you would say this? You're like, you know what? My wife gets more appealing, more compelling, more beautiful as the days and the months and the years roll by. How many of you remember to go? Amen. It's weak sauce right there, man. Like, jeez. Jeez. I'm sure all the wives in here felt really affirmed in that. Oh, wow. So, guys, here's what I want you to do. Those of you who had that, like, weak sauce clap, I want you to get your cell phones out. Go ahead and get them out and order an Uber to drive yourself home today because you ain't going to ride home with her, man. Like, you out. You're done, right? Like, I'm, listen, guys, let me tell you. Let me just tell you. I'm you, man. Like, I'm you. I'm for you. And I am like, I'm like serving up. Like, this is gold for you, bro. Like, like I'm serving this up. Like, putting it on a tee. You know what I'm saying? Like, I just got the ball to the one yard line. You know what I mean? And you all fumbled that thing right there. Like, you had a chance to get some glory here and the way you celebrated your wife. So, so husbands, how many of you, you look at your wives, you're like, yeah, she's aging. I'm aging too. We're all, gravity's working on us all. It's taking its toll on us all. Yeah, but my wife is more appealing, more compelling, more beautiful today than she was 25 years ago. And all the brothers said, Hey, 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 yes, yes, that's much better, that's much better, right? Cancel your Uber, you got to ride to the house, right? So, so, and then I would say this, like, guys, guys, I'm going to help all you young guys here, okay? I'm going to help you, I'm going to help you out here. If you think, if you think what you see externally is all she is, then I'm going to tell you, you are in trouble. External beauty can be, it's making the babies cry, <laughs> like, like external beauty can be eclipsed by an ugly, mean, divisive spirit in a minute. You know what I'm saying? Like, like, like she looks good on the outside, and then she opened her mouth. Like, ooh, yay, yay, yay. Like, what is that, Right? So don't be shallow, right? Like, don't be shallow. Realize there are two yous that make up every person, an external you that's fading away, but a hidden person of the heart that is growing more and more beautiful every single day. I think that's why Peter is, like, pushing for a different kind of thinking about beauty, a different commitment to submission in verses 5 and 6. Look at what he says in verse 5. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves, meaning they cared cared about the inner person, right? They cared about the inner person. By submitting to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. I like that. I like that a lot. And so I told Sherry, I'm like, so is it, I'm like, is it too much to ask? Like, would this be like inappropriate for me to ask you like, can you, can you, would you be okay with, like, just, just calling me Lord or, 
or my, my Lord would do, my Lord <laughs> would do. You good with that? Like I, I, like, I dig that. Like, that's like, we can apply that. Like, that's immediate application. Just, Lord, Lord, would you like me to, like, Lord, would you like me to fill your dream? <laughs> like, I can, like, you can do something with that. And so I asked her that, asked her that. And then, uh, then I didn't see her for two weeks <laughs> until all the swelling in my, in my right eye finally, finally went down. She popped in, yeah. You can move on here. And, and, look, and, and, look at, and look at what he says here to, to wives. And you're her children. Who's, who's children? Sarah's. If you do good and do not fear anything that's frightening. So Peter says that the holy women of God practice submission too. So this, like, this isn't new, right? And, and his point is that you are Sarah's daughters. That's a nice way to say it. You're Sarah's daughters, meaning you're, you're, you're women of, of true beauty on the inside and outside if you do what is right and don't fear anything that's frightening. That last phrase is really, really interesting. It's interesting what it is because it speaks of intimidation, right? And I think what Peter is saying is this, like society is trying to intimidate women, always has been to intimidate women from embracing submission by distorting what it means. And so, ladies, so much of what you hear today is that submission is negative, it's chauvinistic, it's, it's outdated, it's antiquated, it's archaic, it's out of touch with reality, it's detrimental to the health and well-being of women and to the progress of society. But ladies, let me just ask this, would God ever ever ask you to do anything that would demean you, demoralize you, or hurt you. Obviously, he would not do that, right? And so Peter's saying, don't be intimidated by our godless culture. Don't be played by our godless culture. Trust in God's good life for you and fulfill with grace the role that he's given you as a wife. And then in verse 7, he he addresses the men. Look what he says, verse 7. Likewise, husbands... Live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Now, I do want to be clear here. All right, let me be clear here. One verse addressed to husbands doesn't mean that husbands are somehow more spiritually together than wives are. It's not like women need six times more instruction. I I think this tells us that God really understands how guys are wired, right? One verse, to the point, not too many words, right? We'll give you guys one verse. Just can you get this one verse down? Kind of that, right? Right? And and truth be told, like some some men, like some men never get it. So, So after just a few years of marriage filled with like constant fighting and arguing, this husband and wife, they're at wit's end. They finally decide, you know what? We've got to get some help. We've got to go to a counselor, right? We've got to try counseling. Because they had been at each other's throats for a long time. And, and they kind of felt like it was like make or break time for their marriage. And so when they arrived at the counselor's office, the counselor like jumped right in, opened the floor for discussions like, hey, what, what is the primary issue that we're dealing with here? And immediately the husband began just kind of staring at the tops of his shoes with nothing to say. In contrast, the wife starts talking 90 miles an hour, like describing all the issues, all the struggles within their marriage. After around 15 minutes of listening or so, the counselor went over to the wife, looked her in the eyes, picked her up by the shoulders, kissed her passionately on the lips, and sat her back down. The wife sat there speechless. The husband sat there speechless. The counselor looked to the husband and was like, listen, your wife... Your wife needs that. She needs that at least twice a week. And the husband's like, cool, I can have her on Tuesdays and Thursdays. (laughs) Some of you get that. It was way funnier when I was thinking about it. Yeah, you guys are really on it today, man. Way to go. Yeah, Funny. The point is like some men need a little work in the marriage department, right? They really do. But the context here is this. Men in the first century were like trained I mean, they were trained to treat their wives poorly. I mean, kind of the standard rule was this, that husbands are going to be promiscuous away from home. They're going to be abusive in the home, just kind of standard practice. And so, and so Peter is writing into that kind of a culture 
where first century men had not seen a great example of what Christianity looks like. And so here's what he says. Live with your wives in an understanding way. It means to live together according to knowledge. So essentially, let me tell you what Peter's saying. He's saying that that Christ-like husbands should become like students of their wives, like really like into who they are as people. So husbands, let me, let me ask you this question. Like, what are your wife's desires? Like, what are her fears? What are her pet peeves? Chances are you know some of those, right? Uh, what are her frustrations? What are her goals, right? What are her strengths? What are her weaknesses, right? When is she most tired? When is she most happy? What are her spiritual gifts, right? What are her favorite things to do? What's her favorite restaurant? Where's her favorite place to eat? What's her favorite dessert, right? Like, what about it, husbands? Like, we spend all this time before we get married, learning and being inquisitive about our soon-to-be wives, and then we get to know them. It's like we, don't, we stop learning anything at all about who they are. And so we just, we just kind of stop. And so Peter's saying Christian husbands are called to take a keen interest in who their wives are as, as people. So I want you to hear me. This isn't just a call to be thoughtful. I'm not saying be thoughtful. It, it's really a call to be insightful about who your spouse is. Is. Then he says, treat them with respect as the weaker partner. You're like, well, that's great. Like, here we go again, right? No, it doesn't say the weak partner, but the weaker partner. You're both weak, right? That's why we all need a Savior whose name is Jesus. So, so Peter tells, he tells, tells husbands to treat their wives with respect, right? To lift them up, to honor them, to bless them, to cherish them. And he calls them the weaker partner, not because they're, they're weak mentally or spiritually or intellectually. He's just talking about physical abilities, right? He's like, like chances are guys can bench press more than their wives, right? Chances are. But, but he's essentially just saying to men, listen, don't use your physical size to intimidate or to dominate women. Uh, practically speaking, Christian husbands should treat their wives with a tenderness, not like one of the guys, not like a college roommate, etc. Because she is, as Peter says, an heir with you in the gracious gift of God. So Peter's saying that your wife is every bit your equal in essence, in worth, in value, in dignity, in the sight of God. And then finally, like Peter really kind of, I think, turns up the heat, right, to, to, to get husbands motivated to, to really live out the Christian faith in a powerful way. He says, treat your wives as equals, treat them right so that nothing will hinder your prayers. Now, I want you to think about this, right? Peter is saying the way we treat our wives has a direct impact on our prayer lives. Wayne Grudem said it like this. I want you to hear this. So concerned is God that Christian husbands live in an understanding and loving way with their wives that he, God, interrupts his relationship with them when they are not doing so. So, so applicationally, uh, you, can't, you can't treat your wife like dirt and then pray to ask God to bless your business, right? You can't neglect your wife and then pray for a promotion at work, right? I mean, you, you kind of see that here. And so I think it's really, really important that husbands, like we see, like the stakes are really, really high here. That the way we treat our wives or don't treat our wives actually has a direct impact on our prayer lives. And so husbands, listen, maybe it's time, maybe it's time today for you just like, I'm going to repent over the way I've been treating my wife. I'm going to tell my wife, I'm going to tell God, I want to get this right. I want to make some changes. I do. I, I want to live this thing out. I want to lead in the way I'm supposed to lead. Uh, maybe it's time, husbands, that you assume leadership responsibilities in, in your home you're like, you know what? I've looked at it. I've assessed. I know in my own heart I've been really, really passive, and I want to I want to step up to this. Uh, I would say, husbands, it's always time to like get your eyes on Christ, right, and to take take your cue from Him as to how to treat your wife. And and then, wives, listen. I, I want to ask you today: Are you going to encourage your husbands? Like encourage them. And if they're stepping up to the task, man, like, like help them, like build them up, right? Bless them when they're stepping up to the task. And I would say this to all, all the Christian wives who have, who have husbands who aren't believers. I mean, you say, I know how hard that is. Like, I mean, I do. 
And, and I know the weight of that. I, I know you feel the pain of that. And I, I know you feel the stress of that. Uh, and I would just say this. Do what God says and see what God does. Right? Do, do what God says. It feels counterintuitive. Do what God says and just see what God does. And, and then wives, they always say this, like uh, maybe you've been disrespectful. Maybe you, you've done things that have been hurtful to your husband, to your home, and maybe, maybe you need to repent, right? And so here's what I want to do. I, I want to do this. I hope it doesn't feel too awkward, right? But, but I, want, I want today just to spend a, just a few moments praying together, husbands and wives. So here's what I want us to do. Husbands and wives, if you're sitting out there today, I, I want you to, to pray. Like, man, you bow your heads together, right? And take a moment right now. Pray for, pray for yourself, like kind of what you're bringing to the table. Pray for, pray for your marriage, right? Uh, pray for how your Christianity is impacting your home. Pray for hope. Pray for healing, right? Pray for your kids. Pray that God will give you such a vision for marriage that your kids will go, man, I want some of that. Like I've told you, like the number one question whenever I do premarital counseling that I ask, like couples who are about to be married, I ask this question, what do you want to bring in from your parents' marriage into yours? And what do you not want to bring in from your parents' marriage into yours? Well, obviously there are things, right? Like even, you know, Sharon and I have been married 25 years and there are things I'm sure that my kids are like, I don't want to bring that in. Well, hopefully the list is longer as they've looked at our marriage as to the things they do want to bring in, right? Like we hope that. And so start praying about like, what am I modeling in my home? What are we modeling as husbands and wives in our homes, right? And then ultimately, like the goal in marriage is to do what? It is to, it is not only to bless your family, it's to be a blessing, it's to be a blessing to the world. It's to be a blessing to the world. Now here's the thing about marriage. I've noticed about marriage. Marriage just exposes things. So, so if you were passive going into the marriage, let me tell you what marriage does. It just exposes your passivity and just like puts a spotlight on it. If you were angry going into your marriage, man, it just exposes your anger and puts a spotlight on it. And so I think we want to be really, really humble today. That, that, God, is, that God has called us together, right? And every marriage is like tough. Yeah, it's a grace gift to us, but it's tough too because it exposes us, kind of who we are, what we believe, what we think. I mean, you get to see the good and bad and the ugly, right? But the beauty is, is that we, we learn. We learn how to, to treat one another. And then I'm going to tell you this. If you can get your Christianity working in your home, then your Christianity will make a difference in your community. That's why I think Peter spends so much time going, yeah, submit to human institutions. Let's do that. But not everyone here is going to run for office and make an impact on that kind of level. So we pray for governmental leaders. But here's a place you can make an impact. You can make an impact at your house. You can. And so let's just take a moment right now, husbands and wives, if you're here, like you have a boyfriend and girlfriend, you guys are here together. Let's take a moment here, and, and you guys just pray together as couples, and I'll lead us in a moment, and we'll, we'll continue in worship. God, today I pray that, that great marriages would be strengthened, that struggling marriages would find hope, 
and that broken marriages hanging on by a thread would find healing today. So would you heal deeply wounded marriages, relationships, and families today by the power of your grace and mercy and strength? And God, I, I know a key to all this is just, is just humility. And, and I know like the hardest thing in the world to do for a husband and a wife is to say, I'm sorry. We are all so good at digging in our heels and waiting for the other person to go first. So God, I pray today that uh, we would see genuine maturity rise up where husbands and wives, Lord, because of their relationship with you, would care deeply about their spouse would be reminded of the promises that they've made to one another in the covenant of marriage. And so, Lord, we pray that you would just wash over all of us here today with mercy and with peace and with healing and with grace. And that you would refresh our love today for our spouses you would renew our commitment to marriage and that you would today use our marriage to bring hope to our kids and glory and honor to God in this world that our marriage would be a witness to the world that helps people to magnify the name of Jesus and God for those who are soon to be married Lord I pray just for a sobriety and a seriousness as, as they walk towards this, this unbelievably important moment in time to get married. Lord, that you would, you would help them to mature. You would help them to understand what marriage is and isn't. And that you would help them to model the humility of Jesus Christ. And so today we look to the cross for our cues, we look to the person of Jesus Christ to give us guidance. So do a deep and lasting work in us today. And we pray this for your name's sake. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together. Suddenly articulate With a thousand tongues to lift one cry Then from north to south And east to west We hear Christ be magnified Echoing his evidence And his name were birds from sea and sky From rivers to the mountain tops We'd hear Christ be magnified Let's lift this up on Let his praise arise Christ be magnified in me And oh, Christ be magnified From the altar of my life And Christ be magnified in me yeah. When every Find its inmost melody And every human heart its native cry Oh, then in wild and rhapsody
I'll stand strong and worship you And if it puts me in the fire I'll rejoice cause you're there too I won't be fooled by feelings I'll hold fast to what is true If the cross brings transformation Then I'll be crucified with you Cause death is just a doorway Into resurrection life If I join you in the sufferings Then I'll join you when you rise Then we you return in glory With all the angels and the saints In my Christ be magnified in me You can be seated Whew, What a great prayer to end with Be magnified Jesus Whew. Let's just do what God says Watch what God does just do what he says. Thank you for those words today, Pastor Troy. That song, Justin, be magnified in our marriages. No matter what age, wait, what stage you're in. You know, Steph and I are married 33 years, 32, coming up 33. Four kids, they're moving out. Get grandkids, new role in my life. Just trying to figure out our own rhythm. We need coaching. We need help, right? So if you're thinking about getting married, getting married, you're married already for a couple years, married for a lot of years, um, may Christ be magnified in you personally and then in your relationships corporately. And, and I'm going to tell you about something here that, that we're going to offer, not just offer, but that we're going to call you to. We can offer a lot of things. Yeah, they offer that. No, you may need to go. And I expect that next, when, that when we kick this thing off, that first hour, we might have to just move this gathering, Pastor Troy, to one of the largest rooms that we meet here, you know, downstairs or something. I don't know, because it's going to be offered first hour. It's called re-engage. And it's a safe place for couples to reconnect. 16 weeks, teaching, small groups, testimonies from couples who've, you know, had some victories and had some struggles. And it's for all married couples, regardless of the length or the quality of your marriage, your age or your stage, it's for you. And it begins Sunday, January 17th. It's 9 a.m. here at Eden Prairie. It's 11 a.m. out at Chaska. 9 a.m., first hour. So it, it's, we're gonna hold it right over in the old dining room area, right over here by door four, in between doors four and door three. Um, we're not just offering it, we're calling you to it. Marriage is a priority here at Grace Church. It's one of our strategies. If you go on our website, you'll see our mission statement, our, our, our priorities, and then one of our strategies is strengthening marriages. Re-engage. January 17th kicks off 16 weeks. Don't miss it. 9 a.m. here. Go on to grace.church slash re-engage, R-E-E-N-G-A-G-E, re-engage, and, and find out how you can connect, all right? So let's, let's do that, you guys. And watch what God does just in our own church body here as marriages get put back together and strengthened. Amen? Amen? So we're not just offering it. We're calling you to it. All right, let's do this. Um, if you've come here today prepared to give in an offering, awesome. 
There's giving stations all around the building here. And we're gonna continue in worship today as we do that. You can give at one of the entrances, all the exits and so forth. You can give online at grace.church slash give. You can give in the app. Your giving, your continued worship of God and giving allows us to <laughs> offer classes like Reengage, and also um, allows us to offer some training on how to share your, your faith with others. Take a look. I took the class just over a year after coming to faith myself. And I do remember uh, where I was at at that point. And I, I knew my testimony uh, and I knew what God had done in my life, but I didn't know much about scripture. The reason to take the course is to, uh, to equip yourself to equip yourself to be more effective in ministry regardless of what context you're in. Doesn't matter what you do, um, Sunday to Sunday, Monday through Friday, but to equip yourself to be more effective to take the gospel and to advance the kingdom with whatever you're doing. My testimony isn't sharper than any two-edged sword, <laughs> and my testimony might not resonate with everyone. Um, and also my testimony um, isn't as effective as using God's word and take and share life um, opened me up to a set of scripture and passages, books, chapters, and verses that I could use, and I didn't have that before. And, and ultimately, I would say, uh, I'm much more confident after a conversation if I have unleashed scripture than if I've only shared my own winsome words and advice and thoughts on life. Why take the Share Life class? I would say, if you're in a spot where you care about the people in your life, and you care about the people who don't know Christ yet in your life, but you're not to, this, you're not to the point where you would say, I'm confident and I'm comfortable engaging with them, talking them about spiritual things and telling them about Jesus. This is the class for you. Appreciate Tim's testimony. Sharing your faith can be really awkward, right? And I just want to encourage you, this Share Life class is so practical. Pastor Dave Gibson, our missions pastor, he, he's, he taught me, he teaches a lot of us. He says he prays a simple prayer every, every morning. God, just give me a natural opportunity to share Christ with people. Just a natural opportunity, not an awkward, just something natural that where I can talk about you and so forth. And, and, and then, and then he's, he's teed it up in this, this Share Life class, S-H-A-R-E, your secular life, your, your, your home life, your attitudes about religion, and how do you think about eternity, S-H-A-R-E. You'll learn that and how to share that, how to use that acrostic in this Share Life class. Don't miss it. It's a six-week webinar. It starts January 25th. It's at grace.church slash share, all right? Grace.church slash share. If you just want to know how, to, how do I share life with people, how do I share Christ with people, grace.church slash share. If you're here for the very first time, we especially want to welcome you. Really good to see this place filling up. If you're watching online, get here. This is a good place to be, amen? This is a good place to be. We're glad that you're here. If you're brand new, go to grace.church slash new. And some people from our, congr our congregation, from our staff, from people from my own team will reach out and connect with you. And I'd love to connect with you right over at Guest Central as soon as this service is over. Come see us if you're first time guest. We've got a gift for you. Steve Link, good to see you back, man. I'm glad that you're feeling better today. Let's all stand together today. Hoppers back here after some challenging times in the hospital. Good to see you guys back. Oh. Oh, we love you, Lord. We praise you. We thank you for the body of Christ, your church, the chance to be part of it, God. Thank you for what you're doing here at Grace Church. Help us, Jesus, be magnified in our lives as we leave this place. We pray it in your powerful name. And everybody said, amen. See you later.